Hey everybody, this is the Post Movie Podcast. I'm Steve Head. And I'm John Black. And on this week's episode, we're going to talk about the new movie, The Eagle, and the new 3D animated Elton John flick, believe it or not, Nomeo and Julia. And then we're going to get into our picks of the week. And once again, we're recording live at Panera Bread next to the Regal Fenway 13 mm-hmm. yep. in, in good old Boston, which is where we've been doing our past... God, we've been here for like a month now. Like our last four, five, I mean, this, so I'm, it's almost like a regular thing. Yeah, we should get Panera cards so we get start getting discounts. I was just saying to John that like we haven't, in some of our podcasts, we haven't said that we've been recording here. I mean, you know, I, I type it into the notes, but not on the actual thing. So people who didn't read the notes would just be like, well, what's all this crazy noise going on in the background? It's atmosphere. It's, it's Panera. It's Panera atmosphere. You know, before we get started, I did want to, you, um, you didn't get a chance or you refused to go see Just Go With It. I don't know if it was because it was Adam Sandler. Oh, that's right. That's right. Go for Dennis it. Dennis Dugan. Yeah. You know? No, it's because it was both. <laughs> well, you, well, all three. <laughs> you, you, dodged, you dodged a bullet. It's called um, Just Go With It. I'm going to tell people just don't go see it unless they have a burning desire to watch Dave Matthews pick a coconut up off the floor with his butt cheeks. And yes, that's about the funniest thing in the movie. Well, now I want to see it. Now, yeah, no, you don't. I'm sure that'll be YouTube pretty quickly. It's pretty bad. It's it's um, although you know it's odd because Jennifer Aniston, who, who has been pretty in some pretty bad movies lately, is actually good in this. And there's a woman called uh, Brooklyn Decker. I guess she's a supermodel, and uh, she can't act, but they don't give her much to do besides look good in a bikini, and she looks really good in a bikini. And they showcase that in the poster. Oh, in the poster, in the ads. In the very center of it. They they know know their audience. It's it's boys, because they show her in a bikini and Adam Sandler getting hit in the nuts. And that's like, you know, oh, it's an Adam Sandler comedy. You know, you know it's his comedy. So So let me ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you straight. Is this or is this not a remake of the 1968 Walter Matthau, Goldie Hawn flick, Cactus Flower? It's Cactus Flower is credited as an inspiration, I think, in the closing titles. Okay. But I don't know enough about Cactus Flower to, to say it either way. Oh, and Nicole Kidman's in this? And she looks freakish. You're kidding. No. I didn't know she was in it. Her and Dave Matthews are the surprise guest. And um, she looks freakish. She, all right, Adam Sandler plays a plastic surgeon, but... Um, Huh. Nicole Kidman looks entirely made of plastic, including like ripped abs. Like she's wearing, it almost looked like um, a bodysuit of abs and of this plastic face. It's terrible. But Brooklyn Decker is on uh, eye pop. With Nicole Kidman in the movie, is it possible now that she was getting criticized before Rabbit Hole for being just insanely plastic? Mm-hmm. And. Rabbit Hole to me and some other critics sort of represented a melting of that facade. Yeah. But in here, in this movie, and granted, of course, I haven't seen it, is she a parody of herself? Is she is so much being this weird Nicole Kidman thing that, like, is it like some superstars get to a point where they're so perfect yeah. that they become just sort of insanely weird? I, and know, not something that we mere humans can connect with. I'm going to say yes because there's, no, there's never a line in the movie or a reference in the movie about how freakish she looks. You know, it's not like they they make fun of her because she's had a lot of plastic surgery, and they make fun of a lot of people with, you know, like uh, Kevin Nealon's in there, and he's he's got, the guy's got no feeling in his face, and there's all these <laughs> freakish, you know, people with plastic surgery. But then she shows up, but they never mention it. You know, it's like, so I'm going to say yes on that. I think she's lost her freaking mind. And is or is not Dennis... <laughs> Dennis Hugan? <laughs> is he a hack employed by Sandler still? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most of the cast is, um, you'll recognize, it, you know, even if it's just guys in party scenes who have one line, they're the same clowns that have been in Adam Sandler's. The only one who wasn't in this one was um, Rob Schneider. I was just going to say he had to be. No, no, he's the only one, but everyone else, every one of the Sandler group is there with their one line and, you know, collect a paycheck from Happy Madison. You know, and it'll probably be number one at the box office, you know, so, but I would, I would definitely recommend not seeing it. So, let's move on to movies we, we might have liked. Moving on. You want to do first Eagle or Let's no do the Eagle. Okay. Might have liked. Might have. Did you kind of like this movie? I kind of did. It's real vanilla, though. It's not... <laughs> It's just a vanilla action movie. The action's not that great. It's PG-13 because, you know, they want Channing Tatum fans to, you know, get the girls in. It, it is hard to do a film like this yeah. with such 
gladiator like insane violence and keep it PG 13. Remember Centurion? I mean, so, so it basically eliminate, eliminates that, you know, it puts it yeah. at a certain level. But you remember, was it Centurion that came yeah. up? Yeah. Which had insane violence. Uh -huh. And I love that movie. This one is. Like I said, it's kind of vanilla. It's like a, it's like a, you know, when you go get ice cream and you order vanilla, and you say, oh, the vanilla tastes good, but like halfway through the cone, you're like, this has no taste. Same thing. This movie it was fun for a while, but it generally, uh, I had more respect for it after we interviewed Channon Tatum. That often happens. Yeah. Let me let me do the summary so we can uh, acclimate listeners. Okay. In 140 AD, 20 years after the unexplained disappearance of the entire Ninth Legion in the mountains of Scotland, young centurion Marcus Achilia, played by Channing Tatum, arrives from Rome to solve the mystery and restore the reputation of his father, the commander of the Ninth. Accompanied by his British slave, Esca, played by Jamie Bell, Marcus sets out across Hadrian's Wall to the uncharted highlands of Caledonia to confront its savage tribes, make peace with his father's memory, and revive the Lost Legion's golden emblem, the Eagle of the Ninth. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, that's the simple version. Yeah. Uh, the more complicated version is is when Aquila arrives in the mountains of Scotland, mm -hmm. he temporarily takes up residence with his uncle, Uncle Aquila, played by Tom Sutherland. Sutherland. Uh, and isn't it great to see Donald Sutherland in, in anything? Yeah, but it was so anachronistic. I just oh, yeah. didn't believe it. He doesn't it. It belong, crazy. but it's so great to see him. It's like you perk up and go, oh, there's Donald Sutherland. And, and the fella is mysteriously done away with. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's like a whodunit. Yeah. And then it gets sort of muddled in the whole redeeming of the slave thing. Uh, uh, Jamie Bell is a slave. Eska, who is purchased to buy... Uh, Channing Tatum's character, uh, after a tepid gladiatorial interlude. It's kind of a slap, you know, slap and just tickle <laughs> fight. Uh, it's not really a fight. It's kind of like a tickle fight, you know? It's not... Again, I think it's, it's just something that they were working under that creative um, bubble of PG, PG-13, you know? Yeah. It doesn't, and that doesn't mean everything has to be blood and guts. But it's 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 you know it's um it's it's sparring instead of yeah. boxing. So I, I remember uh, all of the critics sitting there watching it, thinking, "We don't know all how this is going to work." And then, like like a minute later, uh, Eska uh, ascribes himself to be you know servant to the man who saved his life, mm -hmm. even even though he, you know he was purchased. He's you know his uh, uh, last breath will be to defend. Um, uh, actually, I suppose. One would suppose. Right. But then, you know, he's, he turns out to be more multifaceted, obviously, than, uh, I guess, well, as multifaceted as we all suspected. Yeah. Um, but I think the movie gets muddled down in, in, in the middle here where Mark Strong comes in. Which one's that? He's the ex Roman soldier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. I think Achilla. Fall with uh, uh, yeah. Achilla's you know, dad and yeah. was with the ninth and a survivor who ran away and. Yeah, yeah, this is weird. And then there's this uh, uh, this fella called the Seal Prince, who I yeah. guess is some way aligned with, uh, you know, what the Romans were doing. And anyway, they're like this outcast tribe of, that covers well, the natives. shaves their head. And they're the natives of, of Scotland, and yeah. it's why they called the Seal Tribe. It may be historically accurate, but I had no idea why they called the Seal Tribe if they're all covered in blue powder. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, that's one of the things you just kind of like, yeah, yeah, but it's also... It's more entertainingly colorful than Centurion, not here. I mean, what I think this movie lacks, and if it has a serious problem, it's the production design. Because I kind of got the feeling that the, the design of this, that the whole ambiance of the film was such a letdown to me that it may be even ripe for parody on Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I mean, this is like a sword and sandal actioner, but at the same time, you're, you're looking at sets that look like they were possibly like... Mm, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, right? You know, some Italian grotto or something like that, and it just it convinced. It didn't convince me. No, it didn't work. No. But I mean, they tried, right? You know, they right. tried obviously That's... with the money they had, you know, to, to mount something terrific. But I don't really think it's so much a failure of the director as much as it's a failure of uh, uh, wardrobe and wardrobe um, and scenes, production design. money. Yeah, it, it. You know, it. Yeah, I think I. There were just there just seemed to be so many limitations on this that it never really got up to speed mm -hmm. um, to be anything but vanilla gla gladiator movie. Tatum's good. 
you know, yeah. he's, he's good. Jamie Bell's good, you know. Um, Likeable guy. We, yeah. we interviewed him, and I wanted to use some of his interview perhaps in the podcast, but I'm not as positive on the review as as you are. It seems to me you like the movie more than I did. I was pleasantly, you know, entertained, but not, mm -hmm. again, you know, when, um, who directed Centurion, when he came in for um, interviews, I forget his name now, but when he came in, I was psyched. I wanted to talk to that guy, you know, and it was a great interview. This was like, yeah, it was nice to meet Channing Tatum, and he was a lot more interesting to talk to than I would have imagined, but... Well, let's, uh, let's, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, here you go. Me and John talking with Channing Tatum. Even in a movie like this, you get a glimpse for a second of what it would have been like. You know, even though it's a movie, even though it's totally, you know, cut, people yell action and stuff like that. When you're in, the, in a battle, in a, in a scrum like that, it's just, it, 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 you can't even, like, you can't even imagine it. it like, I, we fought... There was one take that we did that was about a minute and a half long, you know, during just the melee of it all, because we were losing the light, and they just ran the cameras until until we ran out of film, and I could not breathe afterwards. It was so exhausting. But these guys fought for weeks at a time, and sometimes months. I mean, it, and they would march and they would build, and then they would fight, and then they would march and build and fight more, and and I, I really don't know how they did it. I. I I wish I could say that I was that tough. I, I'm ne I would never have been able to do it. They just were different men back then, and the the elements that they. That's one of the reasons why they, you know, the the Romans were never able to conquer the North because it, the, it was so harsh. It was the if you didn't know how, you know, they're used to living in you know Greece and Spain and, and places like that. It, you know, it, it was warm there, and this was so harsh and so just just you know you had to be a, a really different kind of person to be able to live up there. Where was it shot? Because it's a bleak looking film. Yeah, we actually shot in the Highlands. Uh, in okay. the Highlands near like uh, a little bit above Isle of Skye called Ullerpool. And it was pretty amazing. I mean, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was get up every day and know that you were going to be soaking wet and convulsively cold. And <laughs> it, it's, it's just, it was, it was an amazing experience, but absolutely, I'm not sure if I'd do it again. Uh, not, not in the winter. Not in the winter in the Highlands. You spent and, a lot of time on a horse, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, thankfully, I've, I've ridden um, pretty much my whole life on and off. Uh, I've never had a horse of my own, but being from Alabama, you can, you know, find a chance to get on a horse every now and then. And uh, my family has has horses, and and but this was really, really riding. And yeah. The horse master looked over at me one time, and he's like, "We have never done this dangerous of of, of riding with actors ever." <laughs> You weren't concerned about getting injured or falling off. Oh, you're always you're always uh, concerned because you know it's there's a reason why there's no horses in the Highlands because it's so wet and boggy that um, it, there's no there's no way horses can can go. I mean, you walk one you walk one trail one time it's a it's a mud pit <laughs> because it's so wet that as soon as you as soon as a person steps somewhere it's a mud pit the second time you step there and. Um, but, you know, we were obviously concerned. I mean, they were walking on rocks and crazy, you know, but we had some of the best horses that you can, that you can find in, in the business. They're so, you know, they're so smart and safe, and they take care of you, really. Do you find you ever get intimidated working with certain actors? Because in this film, you get to work with Donald Sutherland. Yeah. Which I, I just saw him last night in The Dirty Dozen, and, you know, taking that, man, like, like cool almost movie, 40 man. years ago, and then bringing it. Nash, what he did here, Matt, I, yeah. yeah, like you're yeah, just like, you intimidated oh, or of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm intimidated with Jamie Bell. I mean, I, <laughs> you name it. I mean, like, look. Yeah. I mean, they they're all they're all like top notch. I look around on the movie and I'm like, oh, I'm the weakest link, right? Everybody's been nominated here for something, and and even like behind the you know the set dress to the costume to the DP. I mean, every Kevin himself, you know, McDonald. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, all, they're all they're all top of top notch, you know. So I this is you know one of the. <coughs> highest pedigree of a movie that I've, I've, I've been on. You really just put your, you know, yourself in the hands of, of your director, and, and Kevin is so smart, and he's such a good, he's an amazing filmmaker, he's really thoughtful. And a movie like this, I don't know if anybody's seen Touching the Void, I mean, it was one oh, of the yeah. first things, oh, yeah. you know, so it's like, he does relationship movies where it walks the line of, you know, right and wrong, and, and love for each other, and... and it, you know, he, he just does, I mean, look at Last King of Scotland, I mean, he walks the line of that relationship 
like to a T, you know, and, and builds it and really makes them have conflict and, and reality and, and yet still somehow makes you care, you know. But he must build a safe environment for you as an actor, though, yeah, to do sure. what you got to do. Yeah, and, but he's, he's really specific, you know. I mean, we yeah. there was no improv in the movie, you know. You can't, you can't really improv and, and I think, uh, 120 AD. You know, you might change change around the, you know, it's not going to be Vince Vaughn. We're not going to be doing, you know, just going off and riffing. Uh, you, you might be changing dialogue here and there, but he's really specific, you know, which is so... You know, if you feel very taken care of, you know, he's such a good safety net for, you know, a young actor because, you know, you really want someone that knows what they want. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask, how do you prepare to eat <laughs> what you what ate in the that movie? That, that, I mean, that was so disconcerting. Yeah. You know? I, mean, I mean, you really all do. All the strange things one does as an actor. You wretch. They, you, just, yeah. you just do it and it's gross and then... And, uh, so they actually skinned a rabbit for no, you to eat? No, uh, no, it was, uh, it was a plastic, uh, like a... We had to bite into this gelatin, like which was disgusting in itself, you know. But Jamie, <clears throat> Jamie really gives you a, a you know, a, a, he just breaks it off, and you're just like, well, you just want to like throw up right there. And and that was a really funny scene that we barely got. It was torrential downpour. I don't know if you could even tell it in the scene, but I mean, rain doesn't real rain doesn't show up on on. Uh, on like screen all that well like so they have to when they when they actually do a, a rain machine the droplets are bigger and and I don't know for some reason you can see it better <laughs> uh, so it's I don't know how they cut this film together because you would do you would do the wide like the establishing shot and you could it's beautiful sunny and then you can see the other side of the mountain like the the lock below and then they cut come in for somebody's coverages and it's mm -hmm. a torrential downpour you know this is like 15 minutes later mm -hmm. and then you cut to somebody else's coverages and it's like white out fog and you can see this weather coming through like the through the mountains like you're just like oh there there it comes mm -hmm. uh, we better, better get this <laughs> hurry up i don't know how they cut it together because it was so uneven i mean it, you mm -hmm. just can't even believe the, the differences and the drastic changes in the weather um, can you talk about uh, Steven Soderbergh's Haywire? Yeah. Uh, can, uh, your character in that, and is, is it coming out this year? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure when it's coming out. I heard some rumors later on this year. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, Soderbergh makes, a, he makes his own style of movies, you know. You can't really, can't really quantify what, who a Soderbergh movie is. He makes so mm -hmm. many different ones, and, and it's always, you know, some, sometimes you'll like it, but you can, you can never say it's... You can never say it's not interesting or bad. Right. You know, it might not be your cup of tea, but, uh, you know... It, uh, Haywire in general is kind of a, a female born identity type film. So is this like his first action flick? Or no, I mean I think Ocean's Eleven is probably you know his okay. first action. I mean if you if if you want to I guess qualify it as that, but um he really wanted to do a spy sort of esque movie and then he never really could figure out his way in his way to make it interesting and and he really fell in love with making it a female and then he mm -hmm. found uh he loves finding non-actors and, and directing them yeah i forget, I forget so her name um she's the gina carano yeah gina carano she's really a really 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 talented i mean i i think she's about as the best that you can get at being a non-actor like mm -hmm. i mean she came in worked so hard she was so good I'm, I'm interested to see what the movie is you know i mean i I know that the, I think the studio was really wanting a really commercial movie, and I, I think that the first thing Soderbergh did was score it like a spaghetti western. So, like, really? you know, I get out of a car and it's like, mm -hmm. and uh, you just can't. Even, it's so weird, it, it, but that's him. You know, he he makes a weird movie always, uh, or not a weird, but an interesting movie. And you know, I'm not sure what is gonna come out in the in the wash as far as studio and filmmaker. Hmm. But um, I play uh, just a Kind of like a Blackwater agent type guy that that uh, is caught in the middle between figuring out who who the bad guy is and uh, trying to bring Gina in as uh, as a rogue. She's gone rogue in a way. I was surprised she had a uh, a couple of films as producer already. Yeah, uh, the one just, with uh, Justin Long. Yeah, Justin. I can't recall the yeah, title, but, uh, ten year, ten year, ten. It's about a ten year reunion. We have like eighteen uh, thirty year old actors, so it's like it was a. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a crazy experience, and it's very kind of like diner, very free form and, and loose. And uh, so, did you find yourself in like you had to manage at the same time be involved? Yeah, That's which was a tricky thing to do for the first time because you know you don't want to give. It's really taboo to give actors, you know, to to even not uh, give notes. You know, you're not. Mm -hmm. You should never ever you know give notes to an actor that doesn't want it. You know, or, or doesn't welcome it. So, you know, I found myself trying to figure out how to navigate that and, you know, and being a producer and having to, you know, be behind, you know, the camera as well. I just decided that I was like, okay, the way I'll go at it is is just simply talk about 
the story arc and the scene, you know, not so much like specific performances, but, yeah. you know, and, and how to do it because that's the director and the actor, but just how are we getting what we need out of this scene? You know, what's, hmm. what's the intention of it and how do we get it and are we getting it in every way possible? And uh, it's, it was it was tricky at first. I was really self self conscious about it, and then uh, all the actors really really helped me and make me feel comfortable, and, and you know maybe not feel so much pressure on, on stepping on toes. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I immediately think of Hugh Jackman. His first time yeah. on set as a producer, and, uh -huh. you know, you finish the scene, and then you think, come on, people. Yeah, you know? truly. Yeah, you know, yeah, like you're you're in the makeup trailer, and you know you know you're. You're sitting there and you you know you know that we're behind and you just kind of like, come on let's go like we got you know but you can't you can't start you know bossing people around you know it's you got to figure out what 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 kind of producer you, will you be will you be like the sort of the line producer or will you be a more of creative producer yes, or, or what you know mm -hmm. so it's 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 a delicate line to walk but if you if you handle it in the right way I really did enjoy it though it was a it was a fun process to be kind of involved in, you know, in a, in a, in a different way. You know, hmm. you kind of, you foster it and make a lot of different decisions, and some, some are the right ones and some are the really wrong ones. <laughs> so failing early, again, hmm. uh, but we'll see. So we, ha we have more footage than I think we could ever ask for. We shot on the red, and uh, I think half wow. Wow. halfway through, uh, the camera crew goes, uh, I think the Book of Eli had just shot in New Mexico, and, yeah. and uh they said that halfway through we had shot three times more footage than uh, <laughs> than than they were there than than the book of Eli did in, in three months, and we were only there for 28 days, and so we were halfway through we had shot three times as much. Wow. So, you know, who knows if any of it will be useful, you know, usable? But uh, mm -hmm. we definitely went off scripts and on scripts. So I mean, we got we got it every every way we could possibly hope for. I think. So, yeah. Well, hopefully it'll come together in the editing room. I, that, it, I've always said that. Room. That movie specifically will live and die in the editing room, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. It was such a free, you know, like I said, free form type of a film. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Well, that was fun, I hope, <laughs> if, if in fact the audio actually did appear there. So, but, uh, yeah, I did have a better impression of the movie after talking with him, and uh, it was um, Kevin McDonald directed it. Right. Um, right. And he directed the uh, Last King of Scotland and uh, Into Much the Void. Film. Yeah, um, yeah, terrific, terrific films. And um, so, th this is kind of a weak point, you know. So, in the end, I just don't know if I can recommend it. I don't there think are better movies of this kind out there. There are definitely better movies with these these actors who've done better films, and the directors done better films. Um, DVD. I watch it on DVD when it comes out. Yeah, you know, but. Um, and, you know, I'm so glad they didn't try to hype it as a 3D spectacle or make it an IMAX. Yeah, it's, it it's down and dirty, but I think that they were more concerned about making sure that a certain audience saw it. Because if it was an R-rated film, you're not going to get all the women that Channing Tatum draws. Right. And, you know, when you say down and dirty, it's kind of down and dirty, but don't track any of that mud in the house. You know, this is boys playing out in the backyard. It's not down and dirty yeah. like, you know, again, I keep going to Centurion, but other epics like that. You know, this isn't Braveheart. Well, there are a couple yeah. moments that are kind of disturbing. Uh, there is the one where they're so starving in the woods. Uh, <laughs> Eska's his tracker, and they're trying to get through this uh, situation, and they end up having to, uh, you know, eat the rat, basically. Yeah. And then, uh, no, forget it. I'll just move on. You sure? You know, yeah, because I don't want to get there. Away. Were there any women in this movie? It's, it's too much towards the end of the movie. That, uh, right, but were there any women in this movie? Uh, I can't think of one. No. no. <laughs> it's, just, it's a sausage factory. Yeah. <laughs> and it's definitely, um, you know... But it's a second century sausage factory. <laughs> That's the subtitle, I think. That's a, yeah. the subhead. When, um, I did love the scenery, but only because I've been... They shot this near Ullapool in northern Scotland. Right. And I actually spent some time up there. Hmm. And the set designer didn't have to do anything to make it look that bleak and muddy and... And you know, that's the way it looked. That's the way it looks. And what is the deal with the accents again? They everybody sounding like they're you know American or, or English. Yeah, or, or it's just just a mess. Yeah. Did they, did they just not care? Because it's kind of a crucial element. They should have. They don't. They're obviously not going to speak you know um, ancient Italian. But you watch it. You watch a series like Rome, which has all these great actors, but they, they talk in a heightened or language. Or something consistent. You know, if you're, if you're a nobleman, you should talk in a heightened language. If you're a slave, you should talk in a, a lower language or, you know, a less refined language. Um, if you're a soldier, you talk a certain way. You know, this sounds like, you, you know, I wouldn't have to see him to know this is Donald Sutherland because he sounds like Donald Sutherland in a toga. 
I kept thinking it's his second Eagle movie. Is it? Oh, Eagle is... The Eagle has landed from 76. Yep. So maybe he's going, you know, this is how he's rounding out his career. I look at that like Anthony Hopkins in the right. Donald Sutherland needs a paycheck, too. You know? So. He does. I'm glad he got one. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Nomeo and Juliet. Now, I want you to be totally honest, Steve. Were you looking forward to Nomeo and Juliet? Uh, not one bit. <laughs> I mean, the trailers are awful. <laughs> but, you know, and the, you know, it's being promoted more like an Elton John movie because he does the music. I hadn't even seen the trailers for the film. And when they did the intro for the movie and it said that it was produced by uh, Rocket Zone. Pictures. Yeah. And then it had a little clip from Saturday Night. Oh, my God. And the movie turns out to be a total, like, mishmash of Elton John tunes. Mm -hmm. You know, just stirred up into every which way to, to you know, basically support the action. And, oh, my God, you know. I mean, I guess there was a point in the 70s where Elton John was cool, and then in the 80s he just was like... He's still cool. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Did you not like this movie? Uh, no, no, I drifted off halfway through. Huh. Uh, sometime after the um, uh, the two owners of the houses started really getting into it, and then I think there was a presentation by the uh, gentleman caller, voiced by Stephen Merchant, who was trying to uh, um, connect with Juliet. And then after that, I was like, "Yeah, okay." See, I was <laughs> it's I was I was charmed by the whole thing, and I had no expectations after seeing the preview. And yeah, it uses way too much Elton John music. I mean, when uh, Juliet rides a lawnmower. You know, to prove that women can do what guys do, they play an orchestral version of the bitch's back. Because yeah. you, know, you can't mm -hmm. say bitch, it's a kid's movie. Yeah. But, um, and various uh, times, Tiny oh, Dancer comes back. Yeah, and just, yeah. I don't know, Sorry seems to be the hottest word. And, you know, I, this is one movie I did not want the soundtrack to. Well, the thing with his production company is, is that the movies that Elton John produces, he's going to be the music supervisor for each one of the films. Right. Like, for instance, they're doing a version of Pride and Prejudice called Pride and Predator. That features the predators from the. They're from the basically um, going to be sticking an alien in the middle of uh, costume drama, and everybody has to react to it. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, or Pride like and that, yeah, okay. like that. That's yeah. an awesome book. Um, you know, so, in fact, I have a quote here uh, from one of the producers. He said that they are, they're literally dropping an alien into the middle of a costume drama where he stalks and slashes to heroic. Horrific. <laughs> <laughs> heroic, horrific effect. So, uh, and then Orton Elton John supervises the music. Um, this is Pride and Predator. Well, this, I here. thought this was. Um, I thought the script was a lot smarter than I imagined. They, you know, it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet with garden gnomes. Oh sure. Um, and, I mean, that's all they really need to know. <laughs> well, I can you do the summary. I'll, I'll do a quick, uh, quick version of the summary. The greatest love story ever told, starring dot 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 garden gnomes. In Nomeo and Juliet, Shakespeare's revered tale gets a comical off-the-wall makeover. Garden gnomes, Nomeo, voiced by James McAvoy, and Juliet, voiced by Emily Blunt, have as many obstacles to overcome as their quasi-namesakes when they are caught up in a feud between neighbors. But with plastic pink flamingos and lawnmower races in the mix, can this young couple find lasting happiness? They didn't need the plastic flamingo. They didn't need the lawnmower races. The but flamingo I was actually kind of funny. Who's the voice of the flamingo? Uh, I don't recall. I thought he was annoying. But, you know, he's there to save the day, I guess. Um, but the cast for this movie is pretty, is, you know... They have, a, they have an interesting, interesting voice cast. Michael Caine, Maggie Smith, Jason Statham as Tybalt. Yeah, he they, was uh, a riot. Yeah, uh, and then they have, like, guest voices. Dolly Parton as Dolly Gnome and Hulk Hogan. As the Terra Firminator, the voice of the he was the, giant like lawnmower. The voice of the lawnmower. Was he, or was he the lawnmower salesman? No, just the lawnmower just, voice okay. on the, the computer. Lawnmower. And then Patrick Stewart as Bill Shakespeare, mm -hmm. Julie Walters as Miss Montague. I, you know, Stephen Merchant as Paris, the guy who was, you know. Oh, and Ozzy Osbourne as Fawn. Yeah, that that was pretty <laughs> funny. Um, I thought, you know, like there's there's plenty of. Shakespeare jokes and references that I thought were good. Um, I thought it looked great. It didn't need to be 3D. You know, it's just another Some people one are saying, things. like, this is great 3D. I it was wasn't okay, impressed either way. But it didn't need to be 3D. You know, there's no there's no special... There's a few things where, you know, like they, a scroll comes out at you or they throw things at the camera to make you remind you of 3D. But the rest of it, no, it, it could have been fine in 2D. And they had these, like, uh, uh, little ultra-gnome characters. 
like little peanut type gnome things, mm -hmm. and one of them does an introduction to the film, uh, stating to the audience that this has been done, you know, oh, hundreds of times, mm -hmm. and this is our version. So I, I appreciated that bit of candor, but uh, the, uh, these other little tiny gnome things just kind of reminded me of uh, the minions from Despicable Me. Right. Um, I didn't get that, but you know, but it, I, okay. To be fair, it was amusing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Nomeo is and and Juliet are pleasantly animated. The kick, you know, it's a kick. You know, it's kids will dig it. You know, it's it's just sort of right in that. Even film. old men like me, I think there's, you know, and I'm a huge fan of animated movies, and I like the attention to detail they put in this, where, um, you know, every time they touch, there's that ceramic clink, of uh -huh. you know, of garden gnomes, and mm -hmm. um, again, yeah, I just I was just. I would have toned down the Elton John. I would have gotten rid of the um, uh, well, Loma races. You can't tone fun. down the Elton John in no, the Elton John produced you know, movie. Right. He's not going to let you do that. Right. But, I mean, it was clunky. You know, we don't need to see Elton John um, caricatures in the movie. Like, you know, a wind uh, windmill or, um, you know, like, a, there's a Oh, right. Of, Every now and then the movie yeah, stops. Yeah, and there's an Elton John image thrown right. at you. And kids aren't going to get that. They don't know who Elton John is, you know? But, you know, when you were watching Bugs Bunny cartoons and they were using symphonic uh, pieces uh, and references to other actors we didn't know, did that make an impression upon you as a kid? You yeah, know, well, you saw like Humphrey Bogart in a uh, Bugs just, Bunny film. I just or, saw the, uh, a one where um, Bugs is at the Oscars, and um, he's walking through the the restaurant, and he sees Bogart, he sees Jimmy uh, Edward G. Robinson, you know, and he he's he's doing imitations of them all. Now it's funnier to me because I know who he's imitating. I think in a way it happens all the time. I mean, the Flintstones did it all the time. Yeah, but Tony here Curtis. it's kind of um, Stony yeah, Curtis. Curtis and Ann Mog Rock. <laughs> Great stuff. And here was, um, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I guess the, the Elton John part of it is going to appeal to adults in a way, but I found it kind of irritating. To tell you the I think, yeah, I think they, they, way, they overdid it. There's just too much, you know. Um, El, you know, it's like, it's like the movie's going along fine, and suddenly they, they crank the volume up to 11 because, of, oh, here's another Elton John hit you might remember. Mm -hmm. You know what they're not telling you, though, in the ads, though, is that this is sort of a race thing. Because the story takes place in the backyards of these two people that I guess live somewhere in England. And they populate their yards with all sorts of lawn ornaments. Right. And these, this, this world of lawn design is basically the world of the gnomes. And every right. new thing is a new pleasure. Every new toy is just for everyone to share. Except for this fact that... Only the blue stuff is enjoyed by the blue gnomes, and only the red stuff is. You know, it's stupid. One yard is red gnomes, the other yard is blue gnomes. One's mine, and, and one they're, yeah. for whatever reason, just taught to dislike each other. Mm -hmm. So, through some strange cir circumstances, wherein uh, Nomeo meets Juliet, because Juliet doesn't want to be just sort of pacifist. In yeah, her her father's got her literally on a pedestal. Right. So yeah. she goes on a mission to steal something from the the, the blue gnomes yard an abandoned house the tw uh, next door to her where they, she goes to steal an orchid all oh, right so romeo's on the same kind of well he's in the yard for something else i right. think but that's where they meet officially yeah so uh, Juliet goes to steal an orchid, and, and in the process of doing that, she dresses ninja up. Ninja Juliet. Yeah, all in black, <laughs> covered up with ninja moves and all that, and in the process meets Nomeo, and they both have that Hollywood type, immediately see each other, fall in love kind of thing. So they didn't have the whole uh, color prejudice thing going on when they met. Mm -hmm. And then when they find out the beach is blue and red, then there's all the family problems. And so it's like a race thing. Playing the race card, Steve. Playing the race card. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend it? Yeah. Okay. Really? I'd go back and see it. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm, I'm a sucker for animated movies. Yeah, I, you know? You know, I'm, I didn't really care about it. I mean, but it's, it, it's neatly done. Yeah, it's you know, cheesy. It is what it is. You know, it's, and I like, I think, I, I, I like the, um, I like just sitting there and, you know, seeing a, this gnome, gnome, like, waddle out. Because, you know, they're not animated very well. 
and then to have um, they have movement Michael issues. Caine's mo voice come out of it, uh -huh. or Maggie Smith's voice, or even Ozzy Osbourne. I think. Or you're thinking, is that really Dolly Parton? And it well, is. Well, <laughs> the fact that they they gave they made the Dolly Parton known very curvaceous and busty was a giveaway. <laughs> but um, Jason Statham is is um, Mercutio. Was he Mercutio? Uh, uh, Tybalt. Ty Tybalt. He's so, he's like the. Uh, uh, the Rambo of the troop, right? You know, and he was. It was great to see his, especially after just seeing the um, mechanic. mechanic. You know, to yeah. have that voice and you know taking the piss out of himself a little bit. Um, yeah, the voice tone was actually really good. Yeah, uh, James McAvoy and uh, Emily Blunt. I thought I, you know, when I was listening to it, one of the things that you always do in animated movies because they never <laughs> tell you in the beginning who the voices are, mm -hmm. so you sit there trying to guess. And I thought McAvoy sounded a lot like. Um, that we were just talking about, Ricky Gervais. I thought he sounded really? a lot like Ricky Gervais. Hmm. Um, I didn't get that. I was shocked okay. when it was when I found out it was him. And then Emily Blunt, Emily Blunt is a delight anyway. So I was just so put off that this is just going to be an Elton John thing, as it was. Yeah, completely. It, it was so again, Battle of Elton John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, could be a problem. Yeah. So hey, should we move on to picks of the week? Yes. Cool. Yes. Cool. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I shall. Yeah. I shall, as I am prepared to discuss the 1967 film Caprice. This is your with second. The, yeah, it's my second Doris Day flick. You're gonna this get This one's a with um. You're gonna uh, get a reputation. Well, I don't know how this happened. I, uh, a I, lot of I, straight men watch Doris Day movies. <laughs> You know? I, I was, uh, you know, I read Dan Kimmel's book, um, I'll Have What She's Having, and uh, there was the chapter on Pillow Talk, and I was intrigued by the impression of uh, uh, the Doris Day ideal of feminism, and, and not what it was supposed to be, and that she actually is kind of a feminist icon, and there's some, you know, some theory there, but, um, so, I, I guess... This is her last film, like eight years after Pillow Talk. Pillow Talk was like 59, 60, something yeah. like that. 58, 59. So this is uh, nine years later. Uh, directed by Frank Tangelin, who was um, uh, the collaborator with Jerry Lewis on many films. And Tangelin, of course, was a, um, an animator. He got to start in the business as an animator really? with the Walt Disney, Walt, I'm, I'm sorry, with the Warner Brothers uh, Bugs Bunny and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so he started making comedies, and, and there is this, I guess, criticism of Tajlin that his his animation, his uh, animated films were more human than animation. They had a lot of uh, human emotions. And then when he started to do feature films, when he switched over to that, his humans were more uh, animated. Uh, more cartoony? Characters. Yeah, more, you know, the setups were all cartoony. So, in a sense, that's kind of what Caprice is. It's... Mm. It's a lot of comedic setups um, done in the fashion that, like, he would do with uh, Jerry Lewis. You know, he and they had perfected many times. Um, but it's also a spy film. So it's it's Doris Day as a, an industrial designer who mm. is, well, she gets herself into trouble when she sells uh, a cosmetics formula to a rival company in Paris. And, Does uh, she do it knowingly? Is she a... Or is this like one of those slapsticky mistakes she makes? And no, no, she does it knowingly. They, basically, she's working for this guy who has uh, developed this secret product that is a hairspray that dries women's hair. I mean, it's, it, like as soon as they go swimming, they come out of the water, hair is completely dry, and she's trying to get the secret of this hairspray to another company. Mm -hmm. you know? And then Richard Harris is like the agent or double agent working for the other company, mm -hmm. or triple agent. Yeah. <laughs> in some respects. So the uh, the film is is uh, it's cartoonish, but what's what's really interesting about it is, is that it's like it's sort of like the um, pinnacle of like the, these mod films, you know, like the very films that Austin Powers is based on, the whole style, you know, right, basically right. what he's lampooning. This is Caprice. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea that um, you know, Doris Day was uh, <laughs> having fun being like some kind of like spy but here's the, the neatest thing of all, okay, is Richard Harris. Like, I kind of could have cared less about this film, had, but, but Richard Harris is And I'm like, they knew at the time that casting Richard Harris, who had been in uh, Camelot, who had been in uh, Lindsay Anderson's The Sporting Life, yeah. you know, these like macho roles, opposite um, Doris Day was going to be a draw. Right. And they were intrigued to see how that was going to work, too. So 
you know, it's 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 amusing. They're they're in this like oh, yeah. ultimate mod film with some strange humor and a wacky type of soundtrack that I actually don't like. I think mm. Duvall is kind of annoying with his like you know xylophone stuff, <laughs> accentuating <laughs> accentuating you know like what's supposed to be outrageous comedy. But um, it's a neat film. I mean, it's it's it was a total failure. It was their last film, and it's sort of this like. Um, oddball thing mm -hmm. that I think people should totally see. And it came out like during the time of uh, the movie came out in '67. So I guess I would say like from '63 to '68 or something like that. This was like the height of like '60s spy flicks. Right. Um, you had the Blade movies, like Modesty. I mean, not the Blade movies, the Flint movies. The, in like Flint, Iron Man, Flint. Yeah. Modesty, Blaze, Fathom, Casino Royale came out. In Matt Helm movies. Yep. The Matt Helm movies, and Which then, I um, still love. Thunderball in 65 kind of like I know you know from Russia with Love in 63 really spurred things but Thunderball was a huge success and then yeah. in 67 they had uh, uh, You Only Live Twice uh, so like 67 was like a really you know it's like what 1984 is the science fiction films 1967 mm -hmm. is like that's when you know the spy films were happening like the um, you know, uh, Hitchcock's Torn Curtain. I guess that was before 60. I'm not sure. Um, or or, maybe, or uh, Where Eagles Dare, the Clint Eastwood uh, written Bert, Richard Burton flick, and then the Harry Palmer films. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, Michael Caine, Caine, yeah. yeah. Um, so it wasn't unusual that, like, you know, a superstar like Doris Day would actually do a film like Caprice because right. the other superstars like uh, Paul Newman and Richard Clint Eastwood, Burton, yeah. Richard Burton, you know, they were doing it. And um, it's also a great time period for movies. Swing in London, you know. Oh, yeah. This is this is obviously comedy, but even in the when you see, uh, um, you know, the Harry Harry Palmer, uh, the Harry Palmer films. They yeah. they take place General in the scene. You know, there's always a scene where they get caught in Swing in London. There's girls mm -hmm. in mini skirts, and you know, everything's cool. And they, baby. oh my God, it, 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 quarter of the way into the film, they totally have it because Richard Burton. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Richard Harris is working for this competing cosmetics company that's filming a commercial, mm -hmm. and like, the, you know, they have all the girls dancing in cages and their and their yeah. costume. This movie is totally mini about skirts and those go -go mini boots. skirts and go-go boots and costume design, and and it's it's I just love so that, that stuff. So I mean, that. I, um, if, I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of the. Um, I remember when the Matt Helm box set came out, I was like the first in line to get it. Hmm. I love Matt Helm. I love the Ian like Flynn movies. Um, yeah, I picked up both those. Yeah, those, it, it's a great time. It's a great genre. It's this little mini genre of, of spy movies and spy spoofs. Yeah, and Modesty you know. Blaze, also a spoof. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it came out in 68 with Monica Vitti and uh, Terrence Stamp. Yeah. Uh, it, it gets crazy as it goes along. It gets, the, you know, the film just gets even, you know, crazier as it goes along. Um, Caprice kind of gets away from the spy genre for a while and it just becomes really supposedly outrageously funny. Uh, so you know, it's got it's it's the parody of the genre. It's the nuttiness. In fact, it gets so nutty that at one point, um, she's trying to get a clipping of hair she, so she can get this. Uh, the girl who plays the assistant to uh, Ray Walston was like the crazy. My favorite Martian. My favorite Martian guy. Yeah, he's Mr. the crazy. Hand? Mr. Hand, absolutely. He's the crazy guy who runs the company that uh, has developed this formula that immediately dries women's hair. So she needs to get a sample of this woman's hair, and she goes to great lengths to do it. And so she follows the girl and her date, Michael J. Pollard, to the movie. Oh and the movie that's playing is Caprice, starring Doris Day and Richard Harris. So it sort of doubles in on itself. You start to see the beginning of the movie with the 20th Century Fox theme, and then the theme song playing at the beginning while she's in the theater trying to get a clip of the girl's hair while Michael J. Pollard is trying to make a move on the girl and ends up making a move on Doris Day, and, and she ends up flipping off the balcony with her popcorn into the... Doris you know, Day? Any normal person would have broken their back in the fall, but, you know, Doris Day just yeah. bounces back up. <laughs> she's lighter than air. Yeah. Yeah, I so wackiness. Even when it's not funny, I still like the the wackiness of the whole thing. It is. It is. It's a. It's not a great film, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it's a kick. It's Don't a kick. Us. And as uh, as I think one of the uh, the lines describing the movie was, it's a kicky title. It's a kicky title. Caprice. It's a kicky title that's more than modern. 
Okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, um, I, this was uh, like something I had to uh, dig up and watch, and uh, I do recommend it. Check it out. Mine, uh, my pick of the week is something called Shopping, and um, it's a 1994 film. It was the first film by Jude Law. It was the first right. film by uh, Paul. A.W. Anderson? Paul Anderson, but he had to change it. Really? AW. You know, I noticed on the DVD the there. The guy who did Resident Con- Evil yeah, and yeah, Death and Race. Uh, but he actually did one film in the late 90s that I liked, and it was the one with uh, Lawrence Fishburne, where he played the captain of that ghost spaceship. Oh, God. Event Horizon? Event Horizon, that's yeah. A great, that's with, a good uh, one. with the orbital soundtrack. Same I did dig that, yeah. Um, this, one, this one's good. It, it's funny. It's about... Um, these hooligans in London, in England, that um, you know, they're bored, punks, nothing to do. So they get their kicks by stealing cars, crashing them into high-end boutiques, and then stealing stuff. And then they actually wait around for the cops to chase them so they can have races with the cops. Hmm. Um, it's it's a little, you know, it's funny to think it's it was made. It came out in 1994, and it feels dated because. Um, especially when they, you know, they're trying, dialogue is like all this nihilistic bullshit, you know, mm-hmm. they're trying to you know about how boring life is and stuff, and it just sounds awful coming out of their mouths. It sounds old. Um, but Jude Law looks very young. It's got Sadie Frost, who was um, Lucy in Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, hmm. um, the red-headed girl who gets bitten. So this was just like a year or two after that. Was it after 94, that? 94, I think. 94. Dracula came out in 93, 94. Okay. Um... They, it has Sean Bean in it. Sean Bean in a mullet, like a, a fashion he, mullet. He always had a mullet, and, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is proof of it. And they, you know, when they um, when they sent me the uh, the release on the press release on this, it said featuring Marianne Faithful, rock icon Marianne Faithful, uh. and. She's in it for about, she's in it for less than a minute. She's the ticket taker at some amusement, like a video amusement place these kids go to. And she tells, you know, she tells Jude that he better straighten out his life. And it's like, a, so she's not really in it. But um, the action's good. The soundtrack is really good. Um, Jude Law is fun. It's fun to see him as a really young, young kid. You know, I imagine this was like around the time of Hackers. And so, Maybe. As, as I haven't seen it, I kind of am assuming it's sort of like uh, stuck in the 90s, as Caprice is stuck in the 60s in that yeah. sort of heightened style. Yeah. But the 90s, I, I don't know. That to me, in, in, to me it's sort of like what, what, what defines a movie as being sort of stuck in the 90s. And when we were doing the Werewolf show last year, we were talking about like um, uh, you know, inspirations for what, you know, like the whole werewolf genre and stuff. Right. There was an American werewolf in Paris. And in them watching this film, that visualized basically what the 90s was. You Paris know, was like or, or, or London? Uh, an American world from Paris. Paris, okay. Yeah. You know, it was like a post grunge type of, uh, you know, like plaids. And I, it's it's hard to explain. Yeah. That's a critic's job is to try to take something visual and put it into words. Well, this and, has a definite. Um, the, the 90s aesthetic isn't easy. Yeah, I don't think. And it's funny to think that, you know, I look at 94 and I was like, that oh, wasn't that long ago. It was. 17 years ago. Yeah. So, um, and I guess um, in the special features, you, they, they make a big point of how controversial this film was when it came out. Go ahead. It either captured, you know, the things kids were doing at the time or, or encouraged kids to go out and do this shopping thing, crashing cars. Not a great movie, but highly entertaining. Um, it's always fun to see early performances and early directorial efforts. And Sadie Frost, I wasn't attracted to her in Dracula, though. She's hot in this. What else has she been in? I don't know. Um, they only have her listed down the back of the um, on the back of the DVD as Bram Stoker's Dracula. I don't think she's done a lot. Jonathan Price is in it. Hmm. Um, Sam Pertwee, Pertwee from uh, Dog Soldiers. Huh. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of it's 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 kind of like watching the Caprice, where it takes you to that different time period where you know these are '90s London punks, you know, which I have no. I was at least alive in the 60s. I, I, you know, I was alive in the 90s, too, but I have no, you know, I was an old man by then. I have no connection to the youth of the 90s. John, you're not an old man yet. Yeah. You're not. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, I would highly recommend this. It just came out on Tuesday. It's worth looking for. Cool.
Cool. Well, I guess that's it. I can't think of anything else other than definitely seek a priest because you get to see Doris Day doing a skiing stunt that was actually done almost 10 years later in The Spy Who Loved Me where she takes her... Uh, she's being chased by a guy with a, an, a another guy with a gun on skis and a helicopter, and she has nowhere else to go but over a cliff. Um, <laughs> Caprice, <laughs> the strangeness that is. Uh, so I guess that wraps it up. Check us out online. We're at post-movie.net, and we're also on Facebook. More fans on Facebook is always a good thing. And please, please do leave us an iTunes review. We would love that. That would be awesome. It ups our ups our credit rating so we get more visibility. A street cred, too. It ups our street, our street cred. cred. Yo, yo, yo. Yeah. And let us know what you think of the show. Send us an email at postmoviepodcast at gmail.com. Or we have a new email address that we haven't been using that much. Not that anybody's been using the other one so much. But uh, we're we at... We're giving uh, you another option to right, ignore. Right, right. <laughs> uh, send us an email at contact contact at post-movie.net. So until next week, I'm Steve Head. And I'm John Black. So long, everyone.